Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. Thank all of you for being here, and be sure those of you who are from outside of Arizona, please spend as much money as you can while you <laughs> are here. We're very grateful. We take all plastic, and so uh, we thank you all for being here. And I want to say a special welcome to our veterans. You know, there are so many members of the military that I encounter all the time who are Native Americans, and sometimes we don't appreciate and understand the service and sacrifice of those men and women. And I just ran to a couple of my old Vietnam veterans who are still around, and I'm one of those pilots that, uh, whose number of landings don't match the number of takeoffs, but other than that, I was uh, proud to have served. I'm, I'm grateful that you are here, and I'd just like to mention while I'm here a bit of nostalgia that, that uh, it was a long time ago <coughs> that Senator Dan and Oway and I worked together for over a year and came up with and passed through the United States Congress and signed by the President the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which, as you know, was a product of the Cabazon decision of the United States Supreme Court. I believe that piece of legislation allowed for the growth of tribal economies in a most extraordinary fashion, and I still remain very proud, not only of that legislation, but the way that it's been implemented by the tribes who have engaged in Indian gaming, including those here in Arizona. And I, wa uh, <clears throat> and I'm proud to be with NCAI. It uh, continues to be a vehicle for empowering Indian leaders from around the country to advocate safeguarding the government-to-government -government relationship between your sovereign nations and the United States government. And if you'll indulge me, I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge several tribal leaders who are participating in this week's conference, including Navajo Nation President Russell, Russell Begay, Navajo Council Speaker Lorenzo Bates, Governor Lewis from the Gila River Indian Community, Chairman Hanani from the Hopi Tribe, Delbert Ray, the President of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community, and Chairman Ronnie Lupe, my old Marine friend from <laughs> from the White Mountain Apache tribe. These men are the most dynamic and dedicated leaders in Indian country, and I'm deeply grateful for their counsel and wisdom over the years. I'm here today in, in support of advancements in tribal sovereignty, Indian self-determination, and self-governance. Over the years, we've made incredible strides, empowering tribes with greater control over Indian health care, law enforcement, housing, and other important public services, but a great deal of work remains ahead of us. As you know, the federal trust responsibility towards Native Americans is based on solemn treaty obligations. It must not take a back seat to partisan politics or crushed under the weight of federal regulations. When we rightfully abandoned the federal termination era 46 years ago, Congress took on for itself the philosophy that Native Americans can become independent of federal control without being cut off from federal concern and federal support. My dear and beloved friend, Morris Udall, devoted his career to this effort. Barry Goldwater tried as well. Dan and Oway tried. Ben Nighthorse Campbell tried. I continue to try. But I'm taking it back. <coughs> I'm not satisfied with our progress. I am inspired when I see tribal institutions growing stronger and taking back control of Indian country. If Washington is to fulfill its solemn trust responsibility, we must listen more to you and get out of the way of tribal authority. Throughout the history of the United States, the government knows best approach has brought tragedy to Native Americans. For example, uh, the recent Gold King Mine Disaster, where the United States Environmental Protection Agency flushed three million gallons of toxic wastewater through the um, uh, Animas and San Juan River. Hundreds of Navajo farmers in Shiprock, Rock, New Mexico were devastated by contaminated water and soil. By some estimates, the nation sustained over $300 million in economic damage due to the loss of their harvest. As many of you know, the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, of which I'm a member, held hearings immediately following the spill. We learned that the EPA 
waited nearly six days to formally notify the Navajo Nation of the disaster. Is that acceptable in America today, my dear friends? Absolutely not. It took, it took the committee issuing a subpoena of EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy, the first such subpoena in 10 years, to compel the EPA to send a witness to testify about the agency's actions. Even now, the EPA has failed to address the damage it inflicted on the Navajo. While the U.S. Department of Justice agreed with me and opened a criminal investigation into EPA's actions, just yesterday, just yesterday, we learned from the EPA's Inspector General that he is recommending that no one, no one be prosecuted for this avoidable catastrophe. Shameful, shameful. I continue to believe that the EPA's actions at the Gold King Mine violated, among other federal environmental statutes, the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. And I refuse to accept the conclusion offered by the fox guarding the hen house that no one is legally liable for this disaster, the largest of its kind since the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico. The protection and wise use of our precious water supplies is a priority that I share with Indian country. My home state of Arizona faces cutbacks by the Department of Interior in our Colorado River water deliveries as early as 2018. So the role that tribal leaders play in shaping our water future are key to averting Interior's shotgun approach to drought restrictions. With this in mind, it's crucial we complete our remaining Indian water claim settlements in Arizona, one of the largest unfinished water settlements in the nation, are the Navajo and Hopi claims to the Little Colorado River. Both tribes are entitled to compensation for the water that flows down the river into the Central Arizona Project and into the metropolitan cities of Phoenix and Tucson. The federal government could do some good by settling those claims through Congress and in exchange, fund and construct a tribally owned and operated drinking water infrastructure project. Currently, 40% of Navajos living on the reservation do not have regular access to drinking water and in many cases must haul their water by truck many miles to their homes. This must change. And I'm committed to advancing a Navajo Hopi water settlement bill once both tribes signal they have completed their settlement negotiations. I'm, I'm pleased that this year's Water Resources Development Act includes two provisions I believe will be immediately helpful to Indian tribes. First, we're expanding tribal access to federal grants under the Safe Drinking Water Act to let tribal governments hire, train, and certify Native American wastewater treatment technicians. Second, the bill provides an amendment that Senator Flake and I authored that would expedite federal permits for removing salt cedar trees in project areas up to 500 acres. As many of you know, salt cedar is an invasive tree species that can consume up to 200 gallons of water per day per tree. Many tribes, including Arizona, including the Yavapai Apache Nation in the Verde Valley, are working to eradicate the cedar. My friends, speaking as an Arizonan, fire and water are our issues. Water settlements must be completed. We have to remove this invasive species and we have to make some tough decisions. I am, another goal we share is ending the misguided attempts by the National Labor Relations Board to assert its control over tribal operated businesses. This is one of the most egregious examples of government knows best in Indian country today. As many of you know, about 10 years ago, a collection of unelected members of the NLRB announced that they would reverse 70 years of federal Indian policy and impose federal collective bargaining rules on Indian tribes. It's an obvious play to usurp tribal labor policies, especially in right to work states like Arizona. Nowhere in the United States are federal and state entities required to impose NLRB rules on their workers? Why should tribal labor policies be treated any differently? This is forced subjugation, 
the opposite of tribal sovereignty, and I promise you I will fight it and fight it and fight it. Finally, I'd like to mention one final issue, the issue of education on Indian reservations. Everyone knows, everyone here knows, that the Bureau of Indian Education is in crisis and has been the case for many, many years. Reports show that nearly 50% of students attending a BIE school will not graduate from high school. That's shameful. The test scores of BIE students trail by double digits compared to their Native American peers who attend off-reservation public schools. A recent investigation by the Independent Government Accountability Office revealed that some BIE schools haven't been inspected for safety in almost 10 years. 10 years. Yet the BIE school system is one of the most expensive systems in the nation, spending an estimated $15,000 per pupil per year. These facts are disgraceful, and we in Washington are to blame. I note with encouragement that the U.S. Department of the Interior announced last month that it will allow tribes to establish their own standardized tests. This is necessary for rural tribes with large reservation land bases that stretch across multiple state jurisdictions. This is necessary. Tribal autonomy is important on the issue of education reform. And while many of us in Congress agree wholeheartedly that BIE facilities should receive all the funding they need, to provide students with a safe learning environment, we must also acknowledge that throwing more taxpayer dollars at a broken system without reforms is not the solution to our abysmal test scores or declining teacher retention. I've met with a number of tribal members on this issue, perhaps most notably former State Senator Carlisle Begay, who himself was raised and educated on the Navajo Nation. Carlisle's story has inspired me. In the Arizona Senate, Carlisle worked tirelessly with Governor Doug Ducey to expand school choice option for Native American students. His work led me to introduce a bill in Congress, the Native American Education Opportunity Act, which would provide grants to Native American parents who wish to remove their child from a failing BIE school and empower them to enroll in a charter or private school of their choosing. There are remarkable private and charter schools on Indian reservations today, like the St. Michael School and the Star School up on the Navajo Reservation. These schools offer test scores and graduation rates that are light years beyond most BIE schools. Competition and choice is a pathway to expanding access to education in Indian country. It's an option we must look at if we ever want to be serious about addressing domestic violence and drug abuse plaguing many native Indian reservations in my state and across the nation. I hope you will support me and consider supporting me in this goal. Friends, despite these challenges, I continue to believe we're making progress on the issues important to you. I'm proud of the remarkable changes that you have made in Indian country, and I look forward to continuing to help you shape the future of your tribes. One of the great honors of my life has been to represent you and our Native American tribes in Arizona, which is the heritage of our state in the Senate of the United States of America. And, I'll, and I would urge all of you to make sure that in these turbulent political times, in these unknowable times, except of course we're going to make America great again and it's going to be huge, <laughs> that I I urge, I urge you, I urge you to exercise your sovereign right of choosing our elected leaders and making sure that every single member, every single member of your tribe gets out to vote on November the 8th. Amen. Thank you and God bless. Amen. Senator, we got a little gift. We got a Is that November 28th, you said? Yeah. Right. Right. Senator McCain, on behalf of NCAI, this gift here was made by your constituents, your youth in this great state of Arizona. They're the Morning Star Leaders Youth Council. And on behalf of them, and, and I just also want to recognize the 
uh, veterans. I want them to stand at this time uh, with their, your brother warrior up here. And go ahead, Senator. Except for the Marines, you can sit down. Marines. <laughs> We're not going to get into that right now. But I just want you to know, Senator, just like our warriors out there, they are heroes. And to you, for your service, to your country, for the years in Congress and the Senate, you are a hero. And we appreciate your sacrifice and your dedication that you have committed to the United States of America. Thank you. You are a hero.